One take one, and we're back. It's getting towards the end of July, and um, time to do a little catch up, I think, because I've got some empty bottles that I didn't um, manage to, to get um, in front of the video. So I'll just quickly sort of do a little run through of those, and then uh, we'll talk about a couple of different wines um, that I'll be tasting here today while I prattle on. And the first wine I'm going to talk about that I had while I opened at least didn't drink a whole lot of was this. <laughs> it's the 06 uh, Marceau Le Grand Charon from uh, Michel Bouzeron. 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 Uh, and I've been seeking this guy's wines out a little bit. Uh, this producer's wines out. Uh, I had an 06 uh, Caillerère. Pliny Monachet Caillerère that I absolutely loved. It really sort of woke me up to this producer and then I started realizing okay this is this is a real this is the real deal um and then I had a Perrier I can't remember what vintage and I like that as well very very much although the Caillere really moved me emotionally kind of really you know opened my eyes to to this whole new producer so then uh, this this 06 uh, um, Charol Grand Charol uh, came came along and at auction and you know, I got a little bit greedy and started thinking, ooh, because this is only maybe a third of the price of the Cayera. Um, oh, yeah, it could be. Maybe, you know, wow, they did such a good job with the Cayera. Yeah, anyway, of course it was oxidized, completely oxidized too. It wasn't even, wasn't even a, a little bit oxidized, you know, a little bit off. It was badly oxidized. And I generally have had a lot of, I w I'm going to knock on some wood here and, uh, you know, say I've had some good luck with oxidization and in the sense that I've opened a lot of older burgundies. I, I buy, um, most of my white burgundies at auction. Uh, so when I do, when I do have a Marceau, I often, it is an auction bottle. Um, and so far I've kind of avoided that. And even with wines from the, from the nineties and the 99s and, Maybe I had a couple of problems with them, some 2000s, but I think that was storage more. Um, and then I know that I had some Raonez in the 90s that, that were, they were oxidized. Um, and so I've kind of stayed away from that producer a little bit. Lafon, I don't want to bore them. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the what the deal is. Apparently it's still a problem because people still talk about it. I hear people talking about it all the time. I know... Nobody wants to invest in white burgundy, really, in a significant way. Um, in some way, it makes more sense to order at a restaurant because then if it's oxidized, they, they'll take it back. Uh, you know, pop another one. That, and if it's still oxidized, then you're just not going to pay for it. Uh, whereas if you've stored it, you know, in your cellar for 20 years and you pop it, you don't really have much recourse. Uh, and if you bought it at auction, you have still less recourse because... Um, they, they won't, they're not going to do anything about it. You know, it's kind of buyer beware a little bit. Um, so yeah, I don't know what to say. Like I said, it was a third, the price of the Cayera. Um, I know I was, I was disappointed just because I'd hoped to, to, be, to be catching a, a Buzero value. There's somebody out there now as well that, that, uh, specifically with the Cayera, and the uh, Perrier, um, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of they're outbidding me on these wines a lot. So um, I think, I don't think it's a secret anymore. And it's too bad. But uh, this one I didn't pay a ton of money for. I didn't pay any more than you would for a new, a new uh, Marceau. But um, still, <laughs> nobody likes to be. Nobody likes it when, uh, you know, the bottle comes out and it's all, it's basically apple juice. Not even good. I mean, I'd rather drink apple juice. All right, moving right along. I mean, why am I spending so much time with that? Had an 84 Leoville uh, Poiferé. 84. <laughs> why did I, of all things, do an 84? Because I was, I was buying another vintage of this, which I'm going to drink and review at another time. So I won't talk about this, but um, I won't talk about it here. But... Uh, 
the, this was in the same sale, um, and it was kind of going for no money. And I remember one of the tasting groups I used to taste with um, here in Sweden. Um, some of the guys there used to talk to me about the 87s and the 84s, and both of those vintages are not, there's nothing I would normally uh, go out of my way to get, but I remember at the time them talking about 84 and 87 drinking well, and that's that's a little over a decade ago, but but still. Um, so I, I thought, you know, this wasn't, for, for what it is in age Bordeaux, it's, it wasn't a lot of money. Um, I was having a case of wine sent anyway, so why not take up a spot? And you know this this had some like lovely you know that those baking spices kind of flavors you know uh, cinnamons and that kind of thing you know cloves and, and that stuff very warm a warm kind of wine um almost a uh, yeasty bread like the fruit is still there but it's very soft it's on the decline it's obviously on the decline um i had it open overnight i drank the glass the next day it was still holding i mean it wasn't it's not gonna get any better but it's only going to get worse and you know it lacks drive it has no drive i would say and it was probably great a decade ago it was probably a lovely lunch wine you know a lovely sophisticated lunch wine about a decade ago or longer um now you know its glory is gone but sometimes i just like sort of sitting around with one of these little bottles of being contemplative and it, as long as it, it wasn't aggressive there was no you know volatile city there was nothing nothing off about it there was nothing off-putting about it um it was warm it was just a bit short and, and sort of generally a little frail and fragile and you know on its way out the door good wine i liked it this wine here i'm gonna pronounce, i'm gonna mispronounce this but donkeys buy <laughs> that's why i want to that's what i want to say is but i don't know i don't speak afrikaans um yeah, it's a South African Grenache Noir, 2021 from Jean or Jean Engelbrecht. Um, everything on the label is in Afrikaans, or at least in Dutch, or, yeah, that's what I think, anyway. I don't read either of those languages, unless, or, I, I don't know. Anyway, a donkey spray, and then there's a picture of a donkey with a surfboard. I like that little logo. The price was right. This was cheap and cheerful. I bought it and I quite liked it. I mean, I, I drink the David and Nadia um, Grenache Noir from South Africa. Um, usually pick it up every vintage. I quite like it. That, one's, that one has a bit more fruit. It's a bit more fruit forward, um, a little lighter and a little bit more precision and drive, you could say. And this this is lighter um, f from the, on the fruit perspective. It's a bit more... Um, it's a bit more savory, you know. That's the best way I can describe it. Um, as if, as if it was, as if the fruit had been stewed in bouillon. That, lightly stewed in bouillon. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's not like oh. I just managed to make it sound gross. It's not gross. It's a good, it's a good little wine. I liked it very much. I thought it was great value. Um, yeah, I don't think I need to spend any much more time on this, other than to say this: this is the heaviest bottle. You're ever gonna pick up i mean it's like i'm not i don't i don't understand the thinking there but in, in one way i kind of like it okay 2017 von from uh, benjamin leroux and i think it was the very last video uh prior to this one that we drank i drank a um 2020 and i noted oh you know there's something there and uh, I wouldn't mind trying some older ones so I did um, I picked this one up at auction these are pricey for some reason this producer is getting a lot of um, it's being talked up a lot so so I I went ahead and did this instinctively I was a little bit against it I mean I'm don't like overspending on wines and this was an overspend for sure for what i considered the level of this producer is um and also the stature of the wine it's a village but it's von romanet okay so everybody gets you know excited about the von romanet sort of words even though it's just village 
the Benjamin LaRue, yeah? Mm -hmm. So I bought it anyway, opened it, and it was, it is a very good wine. It's, it's fairly generous, and um, it's very bon, but in a, but in a almost, almost rustic and sauvage uh, wine, you know, that, that one. Some of you out there know what I mean. Um, it, 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 it's, it's a bit, it's a bit more uh, earthy and, and um, less finesse oriented. A lot more about the, the sort of the big flavors, the bit an, the animal type of flavors. Um, and then I, I found it a little bit soft towards the finish. I didn't think it was a huge drive towards the finish. And what I will say lastly about this particular wine, this particular pr producer, at this time I remain a little bit unconvinced and maybe I either have to go into the Grand Cruz and check one out, uh, or, or, you know, because I mean it. The prices you're paying already in the village class, you're, you you might as well just you know suck it up and, and go big and uh, you know try bust out a bottle. I don't know. I just might do that instead. In any case, it's not really at the top of my list right now and on my radar in terms of pursuing much further. If they come up, I will drink them. Um, and if something comes up at auction, you know, and it looks underpriced or, or whatever, I will. But um, a lot, little bit mixed, mixed feelings about about the old uh, Benjamin Larue. I popped one of these babies. I couldn't help it. I mean, I was too tempted. The Coteau de Vernon Condrieu, uh, 2014, and again in the last video, I talked about the 2010. And how much I loved it, uh, but with the 2010, where that there was a couple of there's a couple of major differences. One of them is 2010. The elements are a little bit disparate at the moment. They they're big elements. They're it's a wonderful wine in the making, um, but they need to kind of merge and, and come together a little bit. That's number one. Number two, with that wine, the fruit is overwhelmingly tutti frutti. Like the peach is very pronounced. It's very vivid. It's hard not to think it isn't a Condrieu from that perspective, um, except for the structure of the wine. Is, it's, it's not Condrieu as you imagine Condrieu or as you experience it normally in typical cuvées. The 2014, however, and then in the glass, this is darker, so it, it looks it's much more pungent in terms of its coloring. You know, it's very it's almost gold, orange, yellow, and then and then it. Um, you know, it's it sort of seems almost like it's going to be a super ripe fruit, and then you you get a little alarm bells going off, and then you taste it, and you go, oh, oh my God, this is wonderful, <laughs> because it does the exact opposite. I mean, it's still yes, of course, there's some peach and some pear even, and uh, very quite but quite delicate, you know, and it kind of gives over to a mineral, a sense of mineral, very very quickly, and to an elegance that really you only experience in white burgundy, as far as in my opinion, as far as I know, anyway, um, there's probably other wines, of course, the white Bordeaux and things like that. But, but um, in general, you know, it's the type of thing I pursue in white Burgundy and and uh, and the 14 of this wine. I'm I'm actually going to do it on camera one of these days. I have some more bottles of it, so um, because it's worth it. It's actually a great wine. Um, yeah, it's. It's a it's a top it's a top notch wine. It's better than the ten, um, for sure, and the ten was was super stuff. So there we go. We have the thistle down thorny devil again. This was a um, thistle down maybe last year, the year before. I did some videos on them. I just haven't posted any you know, from back then. But I, I went through all the cuvées or a lot of the cuvées from thistle down, and it's they're I think they're a really interesting producer. They make great. Um, Grenache, um, Australian, and you know this is the kind of the bottom of the the tier. This is the the, the entry level you you could say from them. Um, and I think it's it really does give you a good idea of what you're going to be getting into as you climb up the ladder. What I would say though is that this is a little hot. Uh, the fourteen percent feels hotter than so, and that's sad. But for a lot of people, they don't care. <laughs> In fact, that's, I'm sure some people want that, but but not me. Um, so I would like. I'm still, I'm still really happy with them with this particular wine. I wouldn't buy it again just because. Yeah, it's 
I don't, I don't, I don't really want anything to do with that week. Um, and then I did a Chanel Le Verain Les Blancs Clos, only because it was 2015 and it must have been released fairly recently and I missed it or purposely skipped it. Um, I don't buy Jerez wines very often, but, um, you know, I know that they're, that they age well, um, and, and, and I like, you know, I like a good Chinot when it's, when it's right and it's had some time and, you know, it's kind of, um, rounding into form, but, but Cabernet Franc in general is, is a nice grape, right? I mean, hey. This is this is quite woolly and um, ripe, um, sort of a big entry, big sort of brawly entry, and then there's a. It's almost like missing an action for for twenty seconds, and then and then and then it, and then it comes back at the finish for a little bit, but nowhere near not, without the impact of the entry. Um, I, th I thought this there was there's something missing here there's I don't know if it's gonna come with time in the bottle maybe it will um, I'm not gonna hold my breath there's a lot of great wines out there I would probably not buy this one again um, but you know I, I kind of understand that there you know I mean the, the, the start of this wine is very promising um, and it's and it makes you you really get this this black currant kind of juiciness that that you, and that you really and it's this sun drenched warmth almost you know that kind of like kind of comes in and but it's got some class and a little bit of stature and then it it just sort of it doesn't really do anything it doesn't it doesn't there's nothing going on there's no complexity there's no it doesn't really add anything to that um, as it goes into the second part of the of the experience and then and then through the finish I thought it was a bit lame duck in a way um and like i say that could just be what it is right now and it's going to be much better in the years to come um don't want to be too tough on them because i know i've had some pretty great ones you know in the in the past or at least better than this in terms of the experience all right enough of that what do we got in the glass today first wine looking at that Ooh. almost almost um it's a it's quite a, a dark ruby um, red but a, but a uh, that's softening a little bit around the edges lovely nose I must say a very um, a bit of a bit of um, it's very complex almost like citrus like orange and, and tea and um, something dark some some sort of some sort of um, morel mushroom juice or something. Or... Mm. That is nice. That is very nice. That is that is a well composed wine right there. Mm. Hmm. It scintillates. It shimmers a little bit between light and dark. Um, and it's got a, it's a high acid wine actually for the vintage for 17 in a way. Um, some spices in there. Again, some of that baking spice in there. Hmm. Very cool. Um, and the sharpness is almost like a, a um, ripe strawberry with rhubarb in a way. But I, I suppose it's more uh, cranberry and cherry uh, very very <laughs> very interesting wine i've started labeling off half the, the fruit families here that, that, that it could possibly be hmm. great tannin that comes in maybe in the maybe in the in the middle and sort of sort of builds up and then slowly helps us along towards a finish which is both driving and lingering. It's quite tannic, fairly, fairly tannic, surprisingly so. Um, I'm impressed. I, I think this is, I think this is a really good value wine, or at least it's a very, it's a very good wine. I don't know if value is in the eyes of the beholder, but in my world it is. Um, and it's the Chambord Missigny from Marchand Tasse, uh, Tasse, 
2017 Canadian who makes these. And this is bottle number 1043, 1043 of 1730. And th these are auction buys as well because, um, you know, when they come up, when they come out, when they're released here at Systemit anyway, you don't see them very often. And when you do, it's you can only get a couple or whatever. And they just sort of disappear. Mm. This is warm. Warm, but warm, but inviting. Um, it's not terrific length. It's not terrific uh, drive to a finish, but just a, a really good sophisticated glass of wine it has that shimmery darkness to lightness thing that you might get in Chambol although if I was drinking it blind I might not go Chambol um, I might I might be more um, Né Saint-Georges or, or but or, if, although a very uh, finesse oriented Né Saint-Georges although they tend to be like that nowadays anyway but I was almost eating some peanuts or I, I mean it's a very really great wine I mean it, it bodes well for the Grand Cru's and, and uh, the higher ups during their vintage and if we just talk 17 again um, you know for me it wasn't the highest quality red wine vintage as a matter of fact it's the weakest one in a long time uh, for Burgundy um, People will argue 13, I suppose, maybe maybe 14, definitely 11. Although I've had good 11s, I've had good 13s, and I've had good 14s. So, you know, can't can't put everything on vintage, but at least 17. It's not normally what I'm drawn to. Uh, it's just that that's what was available from them. Great price at auction. Wonderful little wine. It's filling up my this whole space around me right now. Yes, please. I would buy that one again. Mm. Very much makes you want to eat, you know. So what do we got in the glass for the second one? Let's keep this party going. Ooh. Oh, this is a different one. Oh, wow. 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 What a nose. I mean, that, that is just so great. This This is... This is one of those, this is one of those wines where you kind of go, I love Burgundy. You, if you can drink this wine and tell me you don't like Burgundy after you've, you've smelled this, then. Hmm. It's a little bit lighter in color than the previous wine. I don't know if you can see it. Looks a little bit brighter still, a little bit more um, pinkish purpley than than the other one. Although that is, it's it's definitely it's definitely paler. I mean, you can see through it a lot easier. This is this is this is a proper glass of burgundy actually. Um, there's almost a. It's still too young. It's it's got it's got a little bit of vitamin to it still, but the, but it's softened. It's not a, a harsh vitamin, and you know you know where I get the vitamin. I often get them in uh, young burgundies from like uh, Gros. Uh, you know. Bowler and things like that. There's always this kind of vitamin quality to it early in the year. Almost a cotton candy note in the nose. Also some tea here. Very suave, almost not caramel, but a, a very, a very gentle sort of salty slightly salty wild strawberry mushroom mix 
uh, who cares anyway actually it's more it's the it's the form that, that um, it's a structure it's very I mean it comes in with a little bit of with a little bit of tannin that sort of dries out your mouth a little you know you can feel the, the, the pucker of the little bit of tightness but it but it relaxes almost instantly and then stays stays in the background and sort of haunts the rest of the experience Yeah, and then and then the, that tea, a little bit of the fruit, sort of takes you takes you along, and then there's this this sort of very cooling, cooling, cooling breeze, almost as if a breeze was coming down off the hills, wiping away everything, and just sort of finishing with this perfect little. Tying it in a ribbon. Yeah, it's very sophisticated. I think so. I mean, I think, I think what it could use is, it could use more punch in the mid section. It could use more, you know, oof. Um, it's 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 a lightweight rather than a, a medium to heavy weight wine. There's no no doubt about it but at the same time I mean it is what it is right it's I bought it I didn't buy a heavyweight I bought a lightweight I bought a Bourgogne it's from Cecile Tremblay Bourgogne Cote d'Or I had the 2018 not so long ago and I was super impressed with that um, these are ridiculously priced right now at the same time I'll, I'll qualify that in a minute um, this is bottle number 1376 doesn't say how many she makes but probably a fair amount I don't know I don't know and from what I can read it's a blend of uh, Bon Romanet and Chambonis I mean uh, although she does make cuvées of Bon Romanet and Chambonis me so um, it's probably I don't know it's lesser vineyards or, or the grapes that she's not happy with or or I don't know. All I know is that she's made a real signature. I mean, this is this is no generic Bourgogne. Uh, I mean, you know, how far is it away from the wine that I had previous to it, the Chambord Missy? It's 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 lighter and classier. It doesn't it doesn't have that. It's less edgy. It's less pronounced in that way. And it also, at the same time, when you taste that, it still has more potential. I think that this should sit for another few years five anyway or three or five or something before you you open them uh, which is saying something a in that vintage um, and b in a generic Bourgogne whereas the uh, Chambord Missini from Marchand Tons I think I think it's open I think it's ready open for business I mean you might as well start drinking them now they might get a little bit better but I'm not too sure this I think has got some still something to still some something could happen here there's a there's complete there's underlying layers of, of complexity that are ready to reveal themselves um with time there's floral notes here too yeah yeah really really nice glass um like i say a little li a little light in the mid in the mid palette area um but if you're if you were you know a burgundy lover it's a pure burgundy getting back to that price thing just to end this on um the benjamin larue cost um i would say three quarters of what i paid for for this bottle of wine um and there's there's absolutely no comparison about which is the best value of the two they're both 17s his was a one roman a one roman village this is a a Bourgogne, a generic Bourgogne village, um, or generic Bourgogne. So, so it's a, it's not a village. It's just a Bourgogne, Cordo. So, I mean, um, I, I think this wine is miles. It's more than, you know, the price difference in terms of the quad. If if I was going to do it again, I wouldn't buy the Larue. Put it that way. I buy this one. All right, that's it for this time. Thanks a lot for watching. 
um, the next few videos are probably going to be from Paris, um, where I'm looking forward to hopefully discovering new great producers, and if not, enjoying some of the ones I already know, and in general, taking advantage of the city. And until we see each other again, stay thirsty.